There's no secret. There's no shortcut. Everything that is alive is conscious. Be silent. Be still and know God. Until you feel worthy, it ain't going to happen. Rigorous, ruthless, disciplined focus. You have to get to a place where you can work on yourself. Well, hello, ladies and gentlemen, wherever you may be around the world. I am Jake Warmble, and of course, you are watching the Jay Campbell podcast and the Hunter Waves podcast and part six of the interview with Laura Nyajic. And I'll just open today with saying we had an incredible uh, part five yesterday that was so incredible that we invited a phenomenon of which no one seems to understand that you guys will actually be able to listen to uh, in all its live uh, experience because I think if we were about an hour and 40 minutes or an hour and 35 minutes into the show, and we heard an explosion, or Laura heard an explosion outside of her window, which reverberated, and you could hear as a percussion sort of blast on the show. And then, of course, Laura and our investigated to find nothing, but so hopefully whatever we said resonated in the universe in some way, shape, or form. Um, but today is our, right now, the sixth episode uh, of this, again, profoundly deep interview uh, we've asked Laura about her life and more, you know, her, her mythology, her anthology, everything that she's written about, which is incredibly profound. And we, again, in this quote unquote last episode right now, have just decided that we're just going to kind of go wherever it takes us. And again, today is Sunday, April 7th. Um, can you kind of discuss the fall of Eden and how it's representative of consciousness dropping or humanity falling in consciousness? Yeah, um, we've asked a number of questions about it. I mean, they said that it occurred like 309,000 years ago. And, you know, I spent a lot of time reading uh, archaeology and paleontology, you know, trying to find out what what kinds of things were known about happenings on the earth uh in very ancient times and essentially there were there were neanderthals around at that time and uh, they were you know fairly static for probably five hundred thousand years or so but what the seas have said about it was that it was a it was a change in state that we were that humanity was more or less 3D STO, so that is service to others uh, orientation, uh, in association with 4D STO, so that there was, uh, you know, more or less, more or less what you would uh, imagine from the biblical story where it says, you know, that Adam walked with God, or, you know, inter you know God entered the garden and, you know, interacted with Adam. Uh, so you could say that we were able to interact directly with, you know, 40 STO uh, beings. And somewhere along the way, there was a capture. And it was a capture, the seeds have said, of the feminine energy. And the feminine energy, um, you know, followed a dark path. And that brought, you know, everything down into a lower level of vibration, if you want to call it that. Um, the questions that were asked about it, you know, of course, involved sex. And that um, there was another point where we asked about, about that specifically, and the, and the C said, well, you know, the people were shown what they could have, what they could do, et cetera. And then you think of the sons of God looking on the daughters of man and seeing they were fair and so on and so forth. So in a sense, it was kind of reflective of ancient, very ancient stories that already exist. And so there would be really nothing shocking there except that a little bit more modern um, interpretation or language being used to describe it. Um, and after that... Uh, you know, human beings were separated from their STO uh, interaction, service to others interactions, and the abilities that they 
you know, formerly had. Uh, whether this was an instantaneous thing or whether it transpired over a period of time, you know, is still kind of open. There was also one uh, that they made the remark about, you know, Lucifer, the fallen angel. And they said, that's you, the human race, you know, that you are all parts of a, of a you know, a great angelic being, you know, that it, it kind of split into parts, individual soul units and so forth. And that's something kind of interesting uh, in terms of, you know, philosophical descriptions of, of what the world is like. And I'm currently writing a series uh, that I'm publishing on my husband's blog. Um, and I'm going to kind of get, get into that a little more deeply at some point in the not too distant future in the next few weeks. Um, so, yeah, there was a fall. Uh, we were formerly parts of a greater being, what Ra in the raw material would call a social memory complex, um, and became humanity. Now, as to, you know, all the details, you know, we've got two or three people in our, in our group who've gone to some trouble to try to organize that sort of material, you know, time scales and, and what and whatever's happening. And then, of course, we have uh, things happening at various intervals, and the seas are given dates either as, you know, years before the present or years ago or whatever. And what seems to be consistent throughout all of it is, you know, periodic uh, cataclysmic disruptions on Earth that are accompanied by some of these kinds of changes. There are different changes. Now, when you think about, for example, the blanket of megaliths, you know, all over, I mean, there's many that are extremely well known in Europe, but there are many others and other places all around the world, you know, where there are me megalithic structures where things have been built that nobody can reproduce that kind of uh, building expertise even with all of our modern power and machinery. And the C's have said that a lot of that was involved with sound wave focusing and, and other other kinds of, um, uh, well, what, what you'd almost call paranormal uh, powers and abilities. And they also said that the early uh, inhabitants of various portions of the globe were specifically engineered for the environment in which they were planted. And the only exception was, were uh, white people who were brought to earth from an exploding planet that is now the, uh, the asteroid belt. And so that they, you know, were not engineered to, you know, to actually be on earth. So that's a whole other story, but there's there's a, a very interesting series of responses they have given to there are many questions about falling and you know and possibilities of ascending back. Now, the possibilities of being three D in uh, an interaction with four D STO at a, some upcoming juncture uh, is apparently on the table. Uh, but there's also the possibility of being 3D SDS, you know, going down right other path. Now, they've also said that the period for anybody's actual transition to fourth density, you know, could be up to, you know, a thousand years. That, you know, people are not going to necessarily instantly ascend and become 4D STO beings. There's going to be a transition there, you know, probably the first thing that would happen would be the earth uh, changing into a situation where we interact with 40 STO beings in a more direct and consistent way. And then as we do that, and as we continue to grow and develop, then, you know, each one of us or groups of us would then transition into a 40 uh, STO state of being, when, you know, once you become a, a part of a social memory complex. And that all has to do with <clears throat> networking, naturally, <clears throat> because becoming part of a social memory complex, you know, means that you've interacted with other people. Now, Gurdjieff talked about, you know, the three levels 
the esoteric, the mesoteric, and the exoteric. The exoteric is the outside. He calls it the confusion of tongues. The esoteric is, is the intermediate stage where you begin to ask questions and you begin to start uh, interacting with other people in such a way that you're trying to solve these problems. <clears throat> and I'd say that's where some of us are. But then the esoteric is one where, you know, there is complete understanding and and everybody is on the same level with knowledge and awareness. What one learns is shared with all others so that they all know and they can act as, as a social memory complex. So there's so much about this kind of dynamic in esoteric literature and then being brought up in a, in a, a different way by the seas that, you know, one has to consider that there's probably a great deal of, of accuracy to the way that they've described it. So when somebody comes along and says, oh, um, something blah, blah, blah is going to happen and we're all going to ascend and, and go to our, you know, the, fi the fifth dimension or fourth dimension or whatever they want. Oh, okay. yeah, I, I, I don't think that that's a very reliable way of looking at it. And another thing, another point that I'd like to make really strongly is, is that uh, major transitions of any kind on this planet based on not just esoteric literature, but on the actual, you know, archaeological and paleontological and geological uh, knowledge that you can gain from studying those kinds of things has inevitably and always been cataclysmic. I mean, it's like, you know, if we're going to make a transition, it means a lot of people are going to die in a very unpleasant way. Right. Um, the seas have referred to it as a cleansing. Uh, they've also referred to it as, you know, you know, biblical and in its uh, import and context. So, and I think a lot of people, even people who aren't even remotely educated or aware about some of these things, are feeling this. Yes. You know, they're they're definitely feeling that things are really, really wrong. And I mean, especially with you know the world out there acting like Sodom and Gomorrah. And of course, we all know what happened to Sodom and Gomorrah. So, you know, when the whole world starts acting that way, I think we can uh, pretty safely assume that something wicked this way comes right. and not too far in, in the future either. Yeah, I mean, we talked about it in one of the other shows. We, we all seemingly agreed that the way it can't be longer than 10 years. I mean, again, if, and, I, and I'm not making a prediction, but if the singularity is you know, forecasted, but again, the transhumanism man machine merge, which is what the dark side wants, if we can call them the dark side, uh, you know, they're all projecting 2030. You know, and I, I even saw something recently, it's sooner. And obviously with the trans stuff and all of this insanity, I, I mean, it's so bad. You know, Hunter and I were talking about this before you got on the call today for a second. He just went to a, NC State, his brother plays football for NC State and had their spring game and there was 20,000 people there yesterday. And like most of the young people are, are, are just, they're already transmogrified. You know, the physicality of people is not the same as it was 20 years ago or 40 years ago or 60 years ago. They are making a whatever, transmogrifying the genome so that people are weaker you know, less stable, uh, less intellectual. I mean, all of these things, we, we talked about this, but it just, it's very interesting when you really look around and really grasp how things are changing. It, 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 it doesn't like project to me that it can last much longer. Obviously the intellectual decline, you know, how can society maintain a system of, you know, obviously it's a matrix to wheel, but how does it continue when people aren't even capable of basic knowledge and awareness that you know they had eighth grade 100 years ago they've stopped requiring people to be able to read and and write at a competent level to graduate from high school i mean it's like it's so i mean it really is sodom and gomorrah i mean yeah. it really right. is and you know, if you if you read the read the ancient Sumerian stories, and uh, you know they they talk about how the gods uh, or one of the gods got very upset because humanity was making so much noise. They were, you know, they were upsetting the gods and so forth, and they decided to destroy them in a flood. And then, of course, you know that's very similar to the to the story because it was borrowed anyway. The 
cross in the Bible, but then you have other stories of other destructions like Sodom and Gomorrah. And there have been other, you know, localized destructions at different places on the planet at different points in time. Uh, for example, you know, in, in the end of the Roman Empire was brought about by, you know, cometary, overhead cometary explosions. And they, they all are associated with plagues and, uh, you know, death and destruction and wars. So with all the wars we've got going on, and you think about, you know, Matthew chapter 24, he talks about, you know, there will be wars and rumors of wars and plagues and pestilence and, you know, in, in different places, place after place. And then you know that, you know, basically the end is coming. And of course, you know, a lot of the people on the, on the fundamentalist religious side you know, assume that this means that there's going to be an end and Jesus is going to come and take over. Right. Yeah, you know, there's going to be a rapture, whatever, you know, who don't. Uh, they're relying on on texts that have been really distorted and twisted. So, but the thing is, is that uh, what's, what's actually going to happen is, you know, the world is not going to end. Right. Uh, but the world as we know it will. Right. By the way, to you, just just r real quick, how much of the Bible is true in your opinion? Twenty five percent. I was going to say twenty. Yeah, that's good. Laura, I wanted to I wanted to ask you. So I'm actually reading um, comments in the Horns of Moses right now, and I'm not the best when it comes to understanding like the ancient cataclysms and everything. But I wonder, do you think there's anything where there's like an interplay of human consciousness? Is like a social complex together that either precipitates cataclysmic events or has some weird foreknowledge of like humanity behaving in a certain way because they have this like subconscious understanding that there's a cataclysmic event coming and that they behave weird because of that. Like I've, I've read before, I don't know exactly how to say it right, but that like there's been more wars whenever there's like different solar rays that hit the planet in a certain way or there's different like solar energy or something like that um, do you think there's like an interplay in human consciousness that precipitates these events or is aware of them beforehand so it like brings about its own destruction so that it's not as bad when it gets here well actually um uh, one of our members the one who passed away back last october Gail, right wrote a book about this and i assisted with it sufficient enough to get my name on the on the cover, um, but it's a uh, com uh, not comments in the earth. It's um, Earth changes and the human cosmic connection, and he gets into some of this and says in some technical detail because uh, he he was you know basically a scientist who was writing this book. He was a, an engineer, and he gets into some technical detail. And there's a lot of really wonderful illustrations in there that you know show you exactly what he's talking about whenever he's onto something and he uses scientific studies and so forth and we're talking you know and he's talking about the fact that there is an interactive relationship between what happens in our cosmos and what happens on our planet and also what happens in the feelings or the emotions or the psyche of human beings individually and on mouth, uh, that it can determine, you know, how bad it's going to be. I mean, of course, if everybody just got all, you know, straightened out and, you know, holified or, uh, you know, made righteous or what in a, in a, in a short period of time, it could very possibly change the outcome. But at the rate it is going now, there is, if nothing changes, if it proceeds as, as it is proceeding, there's going to be a mass cleansing because all of these, and, and it's easier to talk about soul smashing. Right. And that's, that's a really scary possibility. There are a lot of people who are, whose souls or whatever are going to be smashed and they're going to be returned to just primal matter. Right. Because, um, you know, cease to exist. Yeah. Oh, as as an individuated um, consciousness, so there are some really scary things coming down on us. And I'd also like to say that, from my point of view, 
we're already experiencing the wave. All of what we are seeing and experiencing in terms of this Sodom and Gomorrah reality, that is part of the wave. Because, you know, if you have a tsunami, prior to the arrival of the tsunami, all the water gets sucked out. Right, right, right. We're in that sucking out phase. You know, and that's what you're seeing, and that's what you're perceiving as as the Sodom and Gomorrah. We're in the sucking out phase, and, and then it's all going to come, and it's going to be it off the road. Do you, you, do you think that somewhat relates, and now we're getting into you know, geo, geo uh, but geopolitical stuff, but what is, a genocide is happening in the Middle East right now, regardless of the side we're on. Yes. And... A lot of people liken it to a blood ritual sacrifice, which we know the fourth density folks, the service to self beings are doing all the time and have been doing forever. And then there was just that thing that went on in Russia, right? There's 135 people killed in that suicide bombing in the mall. So is it happening related to Hunter's question and related to your, your answer? Is it happening? The wave is already here, but is it happening in areas that are vibrationally of a core for it to do? Because we know the Middle East has been rife with bloodshed and violence. Yeah, and it'll, well. it'll be spotty in the beginning, you know, different, different places before it gets, you know, massive and major. But, you know, let me say this. The seas have said that Semitic genes can prevent domination from 40 STNs. Right. And that's the reason that there is such an effort to destroy, you know, the Arabic peoples and the peoples of the Middle East, as they are, they are the ones who carry those Semitic genes, right? Not the Israelis, right? Right. The Israelis are, you know, something else altogether. They've also said that the, one of the outcomes of all of this is going to be a complete destruction of Israel, right? So and, and in Q, we haven't we haven't gotten into the Q phenomenon or psyop or whatever the fuck that is. And I and I also want at some point in the show want to want to talk about Trump and what he may or may not be and you know the whole time travel aspect of Baron von Trump and the whole family connection and all that. But um the Semitic people, and again I know the answer is in the books, but did they say they are are they is their origin the can are they part of the Kentuckian DNA? Some of them, yeah. The can you know the Kentuckian DNA mixed with, you know, uh, more or less Middle Easterners, you know, from a very long time ago, you know, Semitic peoples, and what you have with the, uh, you know, with the, what are, what are nowadays calling themselves Jews, they, you know, they originally weren't even part of that. Yes. So there is a great uh, move being pushed by the 40 STS to try to destroy as many of the truly Semitic peoples as possible. And that's what's basically in process in Israel. It is a genocide and they are being driven by 40 STS and they are, I mean, it's as negative as anything can get because, you know, of all the peoples on the planet right now, I would say that the, uh, you know, some of the uh, upper uh, upper level uh, Jews of nowadays are in very close accord with and in association with 40 SDS masters of the universe, so to speak. So that's just the way it is. And, you know, we just have to, I mean, like, like I said, I don't often think that anything that I say or do is going to make any big change. Uh, but I do it because I want to be continuously sending out the signal that I care about the truth because that's what I'm transmitting and what I will transmit, you know, will bring back, you know, a response to me. So if, if I have a possibility of, you know, any kind of transformation or any kind of whatever, it'll only be because, you know, that I stand true to, you know, principles and, and speaking the truth, because there would be a shame for the universe to end and nobody's telling the truth. Nobody knows what's going on. Well, as I told Hunter, it will laugh, you guys will all laugh at this, but the best thing that can happen with this podcast or this series of podcasts is 
it resonates with the right people with the will and youtube just says oh no you don't <laughs> just leave my channel so it's one less thing for me to have to think about and i could focus on actually contributing to the cassiopeian forum and just doing private stuff for as long as we have left but you know all jokes aside <clears throat> the density consortium the masters of the universe who are they I mean, I, we know there's lizard, lizards among them, but are they also giant humanoid Nordic? They would, they would be Nordic type. Uh, I mean, you know, she said, you know, the Nordic types are the ones who are the who are in charge, and and the reptoids that so many people get so excited over, they're really just, you know, servants or right. even pets. Yeah. Well, or, remember there was one book, Hunter. I remember when we read this. I don't remember which book it was. I think it's book three, but they literally said, imagine being a fort or a, 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 a eight to 10 foot alligator. That's like a dog to the Nordic. I mean, I remember going, holy shit. But then again, we know about the giants, you know, in the past, you know, the giant, you know, there were giant humanoid beings here that built these giant megalithic structures. I mean, that's obvious. I mean, maybe the reps were using them too. I mean, you know, that guy, again, I always forget his name. What was that guy that wrote the serpents? What was that the, the author, um, Boulay? Uh, R.A. Boulay. R.A. Boulay. He, he said that Yahweh was a 14 foot, 14 to 16 foot, you know, reptilian or reptiloid being or whatever, but that he was riding around on dragons. Now, I wanted to ask you about dragons because, you know, what's that guy, Marf Marfuzel or Marfuzel or whatever his name is, and he shows all these, like, ancient um, fossilized versions of what he says, or mud fossil, mud fossil. He, 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 he talks about these fossilized versions of dragons that are found all across the globe, the maps, and, you know, he's been able to, like, run these videos. He's got a million people plus that follow him on YouTube, but he's got all these fossilized versions do you think there were dragons in the past too? I think probably that the the greatest source of legends of dragons were commentary interactions. You know, I mean, if you, I mean, we got to witness one in uh, what was it, Shelly Rinks? Yeah. And and seeing that thing on the sky and the way it twisted and turned and so forth, and that was just you know a small mild one. And that's another thing that's covered in Earth Changes and the Human Cosmic Connection. We're talking about you know, dragons and how they were seen in the sky and different, different types of plasma phenomena. Because when you start getting into the plasmas that are being exchanged between these cometary bodies or between the Earth and some other uh, celestial body, whether it be another planet in the solar system or, or whatever, uh, you're, you're talking about plasma phenomena taking place that is so awesome and so bizarre yeah. that you, you can't even wrap your head around it. and the there are petroglyphs all around the world that represent these figures that appear in plasma experiments right and you're going to get photographs of those in the book because you know awesome. you'll see what the ancients were seeing in the sky in gigantic proportions when, when when we talk about because I think we should just stay with talking about the realm border crossing and possibly moving to fourth density surface to others or surface to self and explain that and deep and break that down and you know drill, peel back the layers. When we talk about a fourth density service to others being versus a fourth density service to self being, they're they're what is known as biphasic, right? They can be energetic or they can be physical. Um do you see a service to others fourth density being being a tall humanoid similar to a nordic tall service to self well the scenes have said that you know the good guys are nordics i mean right. that's really all you all you have is the good guys are nordic types but bad guys are nordics too but right. other varieties you can just assume that they you know, fall under the STS category. I mean, when you're talking about grays or, or uh, dracominoids or even, you know, some really strange, I mean, like the, the case in Mississippi where they had a really strange thing with the cones and, and 
Well, know. I was going to ask you. Let me let me let me ask you that about the insectoids. So you have the indigenous talk about the ant people and how they, you know, there's there's all these mural drawings of like termites that walk upright with wings. And obviously in the ufology, you have tons of people that have been abducted and you know, whether they're screen memories or not, but they always talk about how there's reptoids, there's grays, and then there's mantids or what would be considered insectoid beings. Do you think that is another species or a race or a genus from this what Fort density group? Yeah, yeah, unfortunately, you know, I have to say that it's a very high, uh, high probability based on reports. <clears throat> and then we've questioned the seas about it and they confirm it. You know, what, what I find interesting is, is that at some point in time, somebody sat down with a, a bunch of, um, I don't know, with abductees, I guess, and tried to draw the different races and types and so forth and assign them names. <clears throat> and uh, they, they said Cassiopeians are insectivores. Insect what do you call them? Um, man mantids. Mantids. So, you know, I said, well, we know that that's not anything that has to do with Cassiopeians as we understand them. <clears throat> but whether that was another one of those cases where, you know, time travel was employed, they knew what was going to happen and they wanted to travel in time or, or in, you know, mess up the the uh, understanding which they do a lot and make it so people <clears throat> you know can't get to the truth you know confuse the signal so that's a very a very good possibility laura i wanted Go ahead, yeah man. i wanted i wanted to ask you about the whole classification of all the, these races because i forget which book but i think somewhere the seas had said that they're it's an energetic expression that appears us one way so when we see it we see a reptilian or we see a mantid, but I kind of liken that if we're 3D, they're 4D. If a dog sees a human or a deer, what do they really see? Like we see each other, but does a dog see, like does a dog see us as a monkey or does it see us as like an angel because it gives us, we give them food? You know, like what do we appear to them as, because it's an energetic contract, because like a dog will know if someone's friendly or not friendly based on how they approach that. them. You know, and so when we're seeing these beings, it's our interpretation through like the sensory vehicle, I guess, that we have. So is is that just our best attempt to say it's a, it's a reptilian, but it really is like <laughs> evil energetic construct? Is that right? Or and so that's one of the big problems of philosophy, you know, because the only thing we individually can truly, truly know for certain is what goes on inside our own humans. Right. You know, we'll, I think, therefore, I am. And everything else is secondary. It, it, it comes through a filter or something. And, you know, I always think of the universe as what we see all around us as being almost, you know, totally symbolic. Everything is symbolic. You know, it's the universe expressing itself. But really, what we are perceiving, we're perceiving wave we're impressions of waves that we read a certain way. I mean, when I say the color red, is the color red the same exact color red as what you perceive? Uh, you know, I see myself a certain way. Do you actually see me that way? You know, and we have almost no way to get to whether or not we can match these perceptions one with another to know for sure. Yeah. So, I mean, this is part of what I'm gonna be writing about in this series on, on philosophy. Uh, but I'd say that as a, as a pragmatic, practical approach is to accept that we have a joint reality, you know, because it's, a, it appears to us that other people exist in our reality. Of course, there are solipsists who, uh, believe that everything that they see and experience is all made up by their own mind. Nobody else is real, but them, they are, they yeah. are the entire universe which is kind of a fun way to look at things, but it's probably inaccurate. So practically, we should just accept that we, there are many of us, these consciousness units, and that we share a reality. Um, we clearly don't have the kind of control over this reality that one would think if 
we were all part of the same consciousness, right? So there is some problem that we have to work out in, in that respect. And we um, ultimately, you know, everything is us reading waves. And the Caesar said that, uh, you know, wave reading consciousness unit is what we are. Wave reading consciousness unit. And if you're going in the same direction, reading waves the same way, then you're considered to be collinear. Not everybody reads waves exactly the same way, clearly. I mean, we see that in the geopolitical sphere because there are so many people who clearly do not and cannot see what, you know, another group or another individual can see. But... You know, which one is more accurate? I mean, you just, you have to, I mean, what if they're coming from a different direction and the wave looks direction, it looks different to them. Yeah, yeah. So the best we can hope to do is to find those individuals that we're collinear with, that we, be, we see things similarly or the same and then associate with those people. But yeah, um, reptoids, insectoids, mantids, I mean, whatever. In a sense, we are reading energy. I mean, just reading energy. And we see them a certain way because our wave reading consciousness associates them with that energy that belongs to serpents and, you know, dragon type, alligator, crocodiles, whatever. You know, so, I mean, it, it, it's similar because the brain is... is always trying to find similarities. You, you, you encounter something new and then your, your brain flips through all the card index to find what else it's similar to in order for you to know and understand it you know, based on your experiences. So that happens at a, at a much larger scale within the human mind from the very be, you know, beginning of infancy when we start experiencing and seeing and whatever, you know, that's warm, that's hot, that's cold, that's looks like mom, that looks like dad, you know, when mom or dad looks friendly, you know, whatever, you know, you associate, associative memory. So we're associating uh, this energy with what we already know and understand and we're seeing it that way. So whether or not they are actually um, reptiles or alligators or crocodiles or whatever is almost irrelevant. Yeah, that's how we perceive them, and that's how that energy, you know, comes across. With, you know, the cold-blooded, you know, uh, eating their own infants, you know, whatever, that sort of thing. So, what, do you think uh, relative to this, going back into the giant monoliths and the you know, the Machu Picchu's of the world, and obviously the Gobi, the Gobaki Tepe, and all these jungle places that were clearly built you know using exotic technology we know how the technology the seas have talked about it. it's like some sort of harmonic resonance to lift the stones into place and to liquefy them and then to make them you know solidified but are these fourth density nordics of service to others and service to self you know call them build a race i don't want to call them the anunnaki because the seas have told us the anunnaki are actually reptiles but whoever this ancient nordic white tall humanoid. I mean, I, I don't want to say they're white. They were tall humanoid be beings. Were they walking around amidst third density beings because the, uh, the gravity field was, was at a level that allowed them to walk amongst us back then? Because obviously the Vera coaches, we have all the stories of Vera coach and Lux bottle and you know, these givers of fire and light and wisdom, you know, post blood, pre blood. Is that is? Do you think that's what was really happening? Oh um, yeah, I think so because um, you know, I, I look at dinosaurs. How do they walk around with the gravity? I mean, how do they sustain themselves? I mean, you look at the size of the mouth of these, like a brontosaurus, for example, and you look at the size, and you realize that they spend probably every waking moment. I mean. Compare it to an elephant. How many hours a day does an elephant have to feed to maintain their size? And then you look at this brontosaurus. How the hell did it eat enough to supply its energy needs? Yeah. 
there had to have been lower energy needs, which meant that they could have absorbed some nutrition from, you know, the atmosphere itself, you know, and that the gravity was different, you know, or less so that it was, it was less taxing on their bodies to walk around because, I mean, I mean, just think about it in practical terms, in terms of what we know about elephants. Yeah. Which, you know, and whales, I mean, they swim around eating constantly just to, you know, maintain their bulk, their energy needs. Right. Well, the timelines have been so high, and we know that the, the seas have told us that the reptilian slash fourth density surface to self consortium is going back and forth for 70,000 years to change a future that evidently they can't end up changing. But how far back are dinosaurs? I feel like all of our archaeologists are being lied to, you know, our anthropomorphic, our, our anthropologists and our archaeologists are being lied to because of the timeline hacking and also just because there's really no relative understanding of how far things go back. But obviously Michael Cremo's book is a brilliant, you know, yeah, that's book. I was thinking about immediately because he yeah uh, he he talks about some archaeologists some young ones who uncovered things that they buried again yeah. they 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 couldn't they knew that if they brought this out they the whole would, thing unravels yeah or that they would not get their PhD they would not get their tenured position the Jurassic is in seventy four million years ago yeah and, you know and I spent a lot of time reading all these geological, paleontological, archaeological books, trying to, trying to find, you know, what the exact story is. It's, um, Good luck. Yeah. It's so, it's been so confused and so controlled by the, by the standard model, so to say, they have a standard model of how things was, were supposed to happen in the U S <clears throat> this has lately come under a, a considerable amount of attack because they have discovered that there are sites that are clearly and equivocally dated much, much older, some twice, three times older than what in the period in time in which there were supposed to have been human beings in North America, right? So, in North and South America. So, you know, and, but then of course there were also giant skeletons. I mean, if you've, if you've got any books on that topic and you, and I've got one that's got, you know, copies do. of the yeah. newspaper articles. You know, when these different things were found by reputable individuals, reputable witnesses, and then they get shipped off to the Smithsonian, and then suddenly the Smithsonian says, oh, we don't know what you're talking about. We never got anything like that. Well, I was going to ask you, who is the Smithsonian? That's the fourth density gallery, right? Well, it's, it's, it's got to be, you know, like an STS control system part of it. And curiously, uh, Smithson, who founded the Smithsonian, I think he was brother to the Smithson who took the name Percy when he married the Percy heiress. So. <laughs> Unbelievable. Yeah. So that's a good question too, with all these weird history timelines for someone that's, we obviously kind of understand it because you can't, if a being knows it's true essence, then it's less likely to be controlled, I would think. So is that the agenda behind co-opting history for one certain narrative is is it to make poor people more controllable or is it to like disconnect them from their true being and who they are well you know i've had a lot of trouble with with that um and i mean why why what's wrong with knowing our true history well obviously if you know your true history then then you know that changes come and go you know that there have been other beings on the planet and have interacted with human beings and you know that uh, the planet is periodically bombarded and things happen and you begin to and you have less confidence in your in your leaders especially if you figure out at some point in time that these cataclysmic destructions come about because of you know poor leadership if we want to call it you know mandate from heaven um so, yeah, I think I think it's got to be control. You know, God is uh, God is in His heaven. All is right with the world now. We are the purveyors of this God who is in His heaven. We are in direct contact with Him. You give us our money and your allegiance, you know, and we'll make sure that He is nice to you, and there won't be any more bad things happening to you. 
And that's been done over and over again. So, but as to when the dinosaurs were here, I suspect that uh, that's something that would really be difficult to figure out. Although we know that down in South America, there was, uh, they, they found models like, you know, little clay models yeah, of, yeah, yeah. Old of dinosaurs as though, as though the dinosaurs still lived then. And we know that there were some giants, I think down in Patagonia, uh, very, very recently. So, uh, there's that problem. But then, you know, one of the bigger problems is like, you know, the dating system, you know, how can, how can you really rely on the, rely on these dating systems? Because supposedly they're based on constants, but how constant are the constants? Now, you know, we have learned, I mean, my husband has learned that the constants of nature, so to speak, even, even such things as the speed of light may not be so constant. Very so, I mean, like when they use radiocarbon dating, um, it depends on how much carbon was in the atmosphere at the time, you know, that something died or was, you know, put under the ground or whatever. And what if the, it was a lot of carbon? But then when you date it later, it'll look like it's a lot more recent than what it actually is. And if there was very little carbon, you know, by the time you're applying your dating methods to it, you know, it'll look like it's way older than it actually is. Then we have tree ring dating, which is probably the one of the, if you can get it calibrated with, you know, radiocarbon and, and other methods, you have probably something close to an accurate um, dating system. But that only goes back, so, you know, what, five to 7,000 years or something like that. If they happen to find a piece of wood that they can get an overlap on another piece of wood and then they can extend their dating, whatever. So that's, that doesn't go back far enough to really help us. I mean, it helps on more, some more recent things, you know, within the last five to 10,000 years, and that's stretching your way to the outside, but it doesn't help us on anything like, um, you know, dinosaurs or whatever. And, and so many finds have been found laying on the top of the ground. And then so many others found, you know, buried deep under the ground, you know, that are similar to the ones that are found on the top of the ground, you know, so. Uh, it's it's a scam. Yeah. Um, that's well, I mean, but it, beg, it begs the question: How much of dinosaurs are a scam? You know, because well, you think about. I don't think dinosaurs are a scam. Come on, I'm a person who loves dinosaurs. I, I love dinosaurs too. I mean, you, you think about well, when you were born and you were a young person, I'm sure, like you, we all had this like fascination with dinosaurs automatically well, yeah I had the toys and, I had the figurines all of them <laughs> yeah and, and you know i've got this one book it's this terrific book and it, it takes you through the whole history of dinosaurs you know starting yeah and it's got this amazing illustration just sure i mean i just loved so through this book yeah and you see you know I, and of course it's according to their standard model you know this one was first and then this one was just you know, and actually, I kind of I kind of believe that. I, I don't necessarily believe the actual years assigned to them, but I believe in the progression. Right. <clears throat> because, you know, whoever was doing the, uh, the engineering for creating create uh, creatures on, on, on Earth or anywhere else, probably. And I think, you know, I believe in intelligent design. I think intelligent design is the only solution when you read enough of the, of the literature. <laughs> There is no such there is no such thing as major uh, genetic changes or species changes via natural selection. But there is, you know, micro changes within groups, within species. That happens by a natural selection. But if you look at the history, you see that there are periods when just, you know, many many new species and types and whatever just suddenly appeared and boom right on the landscape and if you look at these pictures in this book i'm talking about you can see how they were practicing they were trying this trying that trying the other thing i mean it's it's so obvious when you look at the pictures and this didn't work out too well no we didn't like that you know, get rid of earth you know and and it's just 
it's just amazing how they finally, you know, arrived at what they arrived at. And and we are a smorgasbord of all these different experiments in our in our DNA, we've got, you know, things that match bird DNA. We've got things that match reptilian DNA. We've got things that match, you know, all different kinds of mammals and, and whatever. We've got sequences, chunks of our DNA that just basically match about anything on the planet. And of course, you know, whole chunks of it's a darn, that aren't really doing anything. So they say, you know, or so they think, or we don't necessarily agree with that, but yeah. You know, they were they were practicing. The creators were practicing. They were playing. They were having a good time, even. And periodically, you know, everything would get destroyed, and then they'd create a new batch. And with everything that they had learned, and they probably had these chunks of DNA in their forty laboratories that they would mix and match together, you know, to create new things. And so, you know, that's what they did with human beings. They've got groups of human beings that have. Um, DNA arranged certain ways or that, that other groups don't have. And, you know, it's all, it's all, a, it's a smorgasbord. It's just, it's, it's terrific. Do it makes me, it makes me oh, think gosh. of this, the seas. I think they said the big secret is that you are one giant experiment and that some humans are in on it and that others are not aware of it. I don't remember exactly how they phrase it, but as, as prototype, you know, something, blah, 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 C and D or whatever. And that they're trying, they're trying to bring in a new prototype. You know, so it's, it's like, yeah, you are an experiment. That's what we are. We are an experiment. And, and, you know, some of these philosophers that are angsting all over the place over, you know, oh, how could God create the universe? Because so many bad things happen and people suffer and so on and so forth. And yeah, we don't like suffering. And we don't like cruelty and, and, and we don't like, you know, things like genocide and so on and so forth. But in the larger scheme of things, we all are an experiment. And let's, you know, let's just get humble about it. Right. Right. Yeah. I mean, that's exactly correct. Um, man, I just, I, I was, I, I walked away cause I was looking for the book uh, cause I wanted to bring him up Hunter, but, uh, are you familiar with this guy, Lou Bald? I mean, this was his pen name, I hold, presume. Hold it up so I can see it. It's Lou yeah. Bald, a day oh, with an extraterrestrial. A day with an extraterrestrial, a trip to planet your Uranus, Lou Baldwin, Lou Baldwin, whatever. Well, just based on the title, I would say I I, I probably wouldn't read it. Well, so it's I never. Fiction. It's fiction. They're like a novel. It works of fiction, but. Yeah. It's, I mean, if you read any of his book, it's literally verbatim of the seas. So, so Lou Baldwin is this guy who writes in Hollywood. And he really is an Italian guy. I forget his real name. And he, he was eventually outed. But he was the first. So he started a book. Not a book. He started a thread on Above Top Secret, which I know you're familiar with Above Top Secret. Oh, yeah. And it was the most read read ever in top, above top secret. I was reading it back in 2003 when it was first started, and I forget what his name is, or whatever. And you can look him up, and I'll send you a link. And I'm sure the C's or or the the, the forum has probably already talked about him or exposed him in various times. But his book Project Arapmanov, which was his last book, he wrote I think six books. Hunter, is that right? Five or six books. He might have more. Yeah, there may be more now, but whatever. Project Arapmanop is like literally like he stole the C's work or he, but anyway, he claims that he is a contactee and that he travels the universe with this little sentient being called, what's the guy's name, Hunter? The being that sits on his shoulder or talk or, or uh, he's band. like a gray, he's like a gray or something like that, I think. And anyway, but he like takes them around the universe and they show them that humans are an experiment. They have like human bodies in these pods and they're like engineering them off, like on all these different planets. And that he like, oh, there's all this genetic manipulation and everything going on. So it's, it's very interesting. It's so name, give me the name of the link. I mean, Ark Mike, I like to read, he likes to read science fiction. I don't. No, no, Ark would love Ark would love these books. I mean, I mean, when Hunter and I first read these books like three years ago, we were like, what in the But then you start reading this guy's work. He does have a Facebook page too, and he's constantly putting like memes from his books up that are like, you know, bigger symbolic messages. It's it's fascinating, but I will just tell you, and Hunter can, you know, confirm or deny, Project Rapmanov is 90% accurate with what the C's have said in the wave series. Literally. 
Well, it, it's, we'll have a look at it if it's fiction. But if somebody's trying to write something like this and tell me that it's, you know, that he actually runs a planet here on this and on. Oh, no, no. Yeah. I mean, I have no idea. I actually, I, I just bought this book when I bought Project to Robin Lop. I never read this book, full, full disclosure. I bought both of them at the same time. Or I might have even got it at a bookstore. I don't even remember what it was. But this person that I trust, who's very advanced uh, spiritually and cosmically, told me to read their books like four years ago. And so Hunter and I ordered a bunch of the books. But I mean, it's, it's, it's very similar to the wave, to the mythos. But um, there was something else I was going to ask you about what you were just talking about with the dinosaurs. And now I forget. Oh, um, are those guys, because again, obviously, the, the, the articles that we just read about uh, Tibet, are the Nordics walking around amongst us right now? <clears throat> you mean good guys or bad guys? Both. Well, if they're fourth density, probably not. Because, you know, it's, it's difficult to maintain, you know, to, to lower your vibrations, to be, you know, be in our density and to hold it. And that's like, you know, Men in black are like 4D STS beings. Right. I have a lot of trouble holding uh, holding the frequency. And, and if you re read all the cases about them, you, you can recognize the, the symptoms, you know, and how they they run out and they run down or whatever. And your impersonations are so imperfect. But I would say that on occasion that it happens, and maybe for, you know, some positive reason, if it's an STO being, um, and it possibly will become more regular in coming times right. because, you know, we think that there's all kinds of bleed through all kinds of, uh, things going on on the planet where, where the, you know, in spots and places here and there, the realities are overlapping. <clears throat> We've even thought this about this recent, uh, bridge destruction. Right. Because it, uh, you know, not, nothing about it makes sense except if they were slipping in and out of 4D, or you know, 4D was, you know, imposing in the in that space time, and uh, you know, like the symbology of it being the Francis Scott Key Bridge and the captain being a Ukrainian, and you know, the the, the name of the ship Dolly, you know, those various things that are the it kind of signal to you that there here is a 4D manipulation going on. You know, it's the cat walking by twice. Right. And <clears throat> I th I'm pretty sure I wrote in in the wave about the most extraordinary case of the spontaneous human combustion with the three individuals who uh, spontaneously combusted simultaneously at, in a perfect, you know, triangle. And they even had names that were uh, sound sounded similar to each other, and one was on a ship, and one was on a on a bus or a, a truck carrying cargo, and then the other one somehow was involved with cargo also. So it was it was like one of these really bizarre things. And when you read something like that, you think, God, this universe is. You know, it's like Haldane said, you know, it is stranger than we can even imagine because things like that happen. So when you see something like this bridge incident with these name, uh, name things and, and then when you watch the video of this thing and what it, you know, what it's doing and the lights going on and off, because that's also another symptom of a 4D bleed through when, you know, the, elect the electrical power goes on and off, you know, wherever, whenever, uh, say, uh, spacecraft, UFO type spacecraft interact with vehicles, you know, that's one of the common things is that, that they lose, lose their power. They, you know, the vehicle turns off, the lights go on and off when they come over houses or whatever lights go on and off. Um, <clears throat> so that seems to me to be a real possibility that that's, that was one of those instances of a 40 bleed through. Well, you know, that, so the, so, so it, I don't know if anyone told you this, but I'm sure they have. But in that movie that Obama, that the Obamas produced, 
it ha- the, the the ship the ship it was the, the story it happened in that movie what was that leave the world behind yeah so that actually happened in the movie that the francis scott key bridge was brought down in that whatever <laughs> which is also bizarre oh. I don't think it was that. I think but there was a barge that came ashore or something like that. Oh, yeah. That's maybe what it was. Yeah. yeah. But the thing oh, is, yeah. you know, whatever something is out there, and, and that brings us to this Trump thing, you know, the, the time travel capabilities that you're, you're dealing with and the, the hyperdimensional bleed through possibilities that you're dealing with make all kinds of bizarre things happen. I mean, you know, if there's if there's a movie made by the Obamas and forty SDS, you know, put it in their minds to make that movie, you know, because they had plans for something that's in that movie to transpire, right. so the people would look at it and say, "Oh, look at the connection." And <clears throat> the same thing about the book that was written many years ago, prior to the of the Titanic, that right. uh, described you know, pretty much the sinking of the Titanic, you know, in a fiction book, which then happened some years later, almost exactly as described in the book. You know, the weird thing about, you know, the JFK and the the Lincoln assassination, the, you know, JFK had a a secretary named Lincoln and Lincoln had a secretary named Kennedy and, you know, the different little, you know, things that have been brought up by various people researched, you know, showing that there were some relationships between those two assassinations. You know, that's something, that's the kind of thing that that happens when you're doing time traveling and when you're overlapping 4D with 3D. And um, 9-11, supposedly there was something predictive about that in a movie or in a a comic book or something, you know, about the collapse of the... The Simpsons. The Simpsons predicted. (laughs) Okay, the, the, the Simpsons. And that's the kind of stuff that happens. And it's when you see that kind of stuff, you recognize that there has been some meddling with the timeline. There have been some meddling with our reality. Um, you know, things have been, are really pretty weird. I mean, it's are they, is, well, is Fort Density doing it just to joke with us? Like, it's like, ha. Like, well, sometimes it may be, I don't, I don't think they have a sense of humor, but I think they, they may do it to torture us. That's what I mean. But, you know, there's something that happened to us that was really weird. And we had it's described in detail in one of the sessions that was posted on the forum along with the photographs. But to, to make a long story short, uh, years ago, Ark and I went to <clears throat> the blood bank <clears throat> in Florida because we wanted to get our blood types, right? Because we were reading the blood type diet book, right? We wanted yeah, to get did Peter Diama. Love that book. Uh, so we went to donate blood, and at the end of it, you get like a free gift or something. You know, they give you snackies and goodies, and then you get a little free gift, and you get to pick. And he picked, he picked this little ball baseball cap, you know, and it said Florida Blood Services, FBS on the front of it. And he really loved this cap because it was lightweight, it was light colored, and he could wear it on hot days and protect his head from the sun without yeah. overheating. Love this cap. And I mean, he wore it. We went to Rome one year and he, we were on this tour bus, and you know, his cap blew off, and our son in law jumped down off the bus, and ran across, you know, the range of traffic to, and, and some guy jumped out of his car and caught the cap and gave it to him, and he brings it across. Ross. And this big drama over this cap because he really loved this cap. <clears throat> so then back in, uh, 2019, early 2019, we went to a uh, we went to a conference in Paris, and not long after the conference, we were back home, and it was strange because we went. It was like a almost a paranormal type conference, and you know they were all very happy to have Arg there because you know he's a real physicist, you know, you know and. <clears throat> Shortly thereafter, his cap disappeared. So we're all searching for his cap. So I searched around in our office here, and uh, he searched for it. 
and I, I don't remember which one of us found it, whether it was me or him, but it, it's, in the, it's in the account on the forum. And we found the cap, but then his sister, who had gone out with him in the car, like the day previous, came in the kitchen and she says, I found your cap. You left it in the car. There was two of them. There was physically two of them, and there had never ever been two of them. There was only yeah. one. Were they like were they exactly the same two, like worn by Ark? You could tell broken in and everything. They wow. were exactly the same, except that one of them had a stain on it where he had, he hit his head or bumped his head or something, and then he put his cap on to go somewhere and it and it like got a little stain of blood. Work, yeah. <clears throat> so one had the stain on it and one didn't. Wow. Well, we photographed them, you know, we took them around, we showed them, you know, you know, this happened, this is, you know, it's really freaky. And not long after, um, our cancer. Damn. And we went through this whole, <clears throat> and then of course, you know, COVID came along and you know, this was riding around 2019 and 2020. And he spent most of 2000, the second half of 2020 and part of 2021 doing chemotherapy. And as soon as, not long after he was pronounced in remission and everything was fine and dandy, you know, the cat disappeared. For real. Gone. When I mean, we have searched everywhere. It's gone. Both of them or just one? Just one. Was it the one with the blood or not the blood? It was the one without the blood. Just gone. Wow. It makes me think, <clears throat> um, I was at the beach with Jay and Monica one year. Oh, dude, and that's Jay, This is crazy. I, I forget about just how insane this is. I guess theoretically it's possible. Jay lost his wedding band in the ocean. In I ran out. I was throwing football with my daughter, and I literally threw the threw into the ocean, sand into the ocean. It was like, I mean, I told her right away. She's like, oh, we'll just get another one. Tell, tell them the rest of the story, Hunter. And so the next morning, Monica's walking on the beach real early by herself, and she's just walking kind of like where the water meets the sand and just like brushes up on your feet. And she looks down, just happenstance, and the ring is in the ocean sand right there. And she just picks right in it front up, of her, right in front of her. God, God's honest truth story. And she actually said that she had a premonition to look right there. So it was literally like some benevolent form of the universe. Yeah. So there is, you know, whenever you start seeing all of these synchron synchronicities. These strange symbolic representations stop and pay attention, right? And ask questions, you know, what, you know, what is it? Is this something from outside me, so to speak, assuming there is anything outside us? We can trust the philosophers. Right. Is this something outside of me affecting me or interacting with me or doing something diddling with my timeline or my life? Or is this something that is happening because I have manifested it myself to send a signal to myself? Because those those are two very good options. There are probably other options, but those are two very good options because I know that I've done things with my mental power to send signals to myself, you know, like the, you know, any number of things. Well, Laura, this is to, to that point, this happened to me actually this week. Um, my girlfriend's brother-in-law, his last name is McKenzie and he's claims he's Scottish. We don't know, but he, you know how people like claim ancestor or whatever, and they'll have like flags in their house. They have really no connection with it. But anyway, he always says like, my house is the McKenzie clan. And we were talking at dinner and she was like, she said something. She's like, we were talking about him and she was like, oh yeah, you know, him and his McKenzie clan nonsense or whatever. And it's like a saying they have in their family. And we were going to watch a TV show that night. And funny enough, I always, I like to read fiction books about time travel and there's a series. I haven't read the books, but there's a series called outlander, which I guess is about time travel. And 
she's like, oh, we'll, let's watch this because I started watching it a long time ago and I never watched it. I was like, okay, that's cool. It's about time travel. And within the first five minutes of that show, a British guy is in the thing and they're like in Scotland or whatever. And he goes into a hostel and she's like, the secretary at the hostel is like, welcome to our place. This is a uh, family owned business by the McKinsey clan. And we were just like, so weirded out that 15 minutes before she just offhandedly said McKinsey clan. And then the TV show, they said McKinsey clan. Now I know like statistically, yeah, sure. But to, to say those exact words and then 15 minutes later, hear them in a TV show that was also about time travel. Uh, it was just like, but it wasn't, we didn't get weirded out. But we were like, wow, that is so like fascinating that 15 minutes ago we said that exact phrase and it came up in the TV show. <laughs> well, and that, that sort of thing is, is, uh, is evidence of, first of all, the consciousness nature of the universe. Uh, but also the complexity of it and the, you know, it's so far beyond anything. I think we can really comprehend at our level of being, you know, that it's almost comical to think that philosophers are trying to figure all this out because, <laughs> you know, if you sit around and you really observe, and that's, that's one of the things I was doing when I was writing the way instance after instance of this that and the other thing you know to bring up you know when i was working on a particular point you know bringing up cases and and quotes and citations to show just how strange this world is and of course you know the, the actual absolute treasure trove of that sort of thing is is the works of charles ford yeah. right. <clears throat> if you start really thinking about and you and i've got a lot of different kinds of books of like books of marvels you know where really strange or bizarre things you know because i just love this kind of stuff you know i, I read through these things and and discover things that are that have happened over the over the centuries or all around the world and and the world is such a strange bizarre place that these people who subscribe to you know total materialism and darwinian evolution even the neo-darwinian or you know accidental uh emergence of life and so on and so forth you know clearly are not paying freaking attention to what's happening on this planet not even in maybe nothing weird ever happens to them in their lives maybe they are soulless <laughs> you know and well, nothing will really happen to them. You know, they can't see it. They can't understand it. They can't, you know, cope with it. They can't recognize it. They can't wave read it. So maybe they can't, you know? And I got into a, a, a real discussion over uh, one of the members of the Skeptic Society about, you know, were there people who didn't have souls? And, of course, he doesn't believe in souls. Michael, it was, it wasn't Michael Shermer, was it? No, it was somebody, I, I mean, I may have written about it in there somewhere, but it's somewhere. And you know, you got to a big discussion about it. And I, and he says, well, I would really like to have one of these experiences that would prove to me I have a soul and da, 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 da. And so I wrote back to him and I said, well, you know, if you haven't, then you haven't. But there are a lot of people who have and who are reliable and who are good observers and who are, uh, you know, educated, um, whatever. And, you know, obviously you just don't have one. And then, boy, did he get upset. That's awesome. I don't have a soul. <clears throat> so, you said, you're the one who said they didn't exist. <laughs> yeah, like, I couldn't figure it out. I mean, I told him, he, he, obviously. Your logic I, doesn't compute, bro. You know, if you don't have any of experience, obviously you don't have one. Well, wait a minute. I want one. So, yeah. It's all, uh. But we are in a, a universe of such stupendous complexity and amazing uh, happenings that happen to all of us or most of us individually in our lives, like McKinsey's and McKinsey's and numerous of the, you know, two hats and losing and finding a ring. And, you know, many of the things that are reported in the whole wave series, many, many, many things. And so that, you know, anybody who is trying to sit down and say they've got it all figured out and it happens this way, that way, or the other way, you know, I mean, just 
Forget about it. Yeah, I mean, it's, I mean, and that's why my answers are always so, you know, they're here, 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 and here, yeah, you know, right. different, going at it from different directions. And those are just the directions I, you know, think of off the top of my head at the moment. There are probably many, many more, and other people who are watching will think of others. Right. Um, there's, it's not simple. Do you, do you think, and getting back to, because I really like this for density, the wave, you know, service to others, service to self. Like when, when the seas talk about the cleansing, who's going to be cleansed? Is it, is it, is it relative to your vibration? Is it relative to your frequency, your frequency resonance vibration? Is that really the distinct factor? Well, the question is not just, <laughs> here we go again. The question is not, but who's going to be cleansed, but what happens to those who are cleansed? I mean, for example, somebody who has a higher frequency may be involved in events that cleanse, you know, 500 people who are very low frequency, but what happens to them after transition is going to be very different from what happens to those other 500, see? I mean, you know, I may get, I may get first hit right on my head and... You know what will happen to me. You know depends on my frequency. Yeah. <clears throat> As with any kind of uh, non-linear type of event, such as a whole bunch of you know comet fragments, you know flying into the Earth's atmosphere and exploding up in the atmosphere and ablating the landscape, there are going to be a lot of people. You know who are going to be uh, of higher frequency or who, who are going to go and then there are going to be a whole lot of people who are low frequency who are going to go so it's it's the seas have said it's not where you are it's who you are and what you see the counts and if you can obviously if you take that into the next logical step if you can see what's going on you might move yourself to a place where you know you could survive better from at least some of the things we can't we can't predict things about cometary explosions, but we can certainly predict when when countries are kind of probably going to go to war and everybody's going to get nuked. You know, there there are some things we have some small amount of control over, but not a whole lot. Well, I, well, question I have around it, and I, and I know we're all opinion of opining, but is does it ultimately matter? I mean. It does to survive longer in a physical body, but if you're going to move with the wave when the wave comes, whenever it comes, and that also opens up the question, does the wave express differently from a space-time continuum at different locations? So could it be earlier in one place that's a quote-unquote of a higher vibrational place versus less than, you know, less than happening? You know, we're getting kind of into... If there are uh, groups... Of, if there are groups of people of a higher vibration and they're congregated into an area, it's very possible that their location could be moved into fourth density in advance and they would not experience any of it. That's what I was getting with. And, that, and that's kind of, and, and again, I, I hate to bring her up, but that's kind of like Hunter, as you know, the, Dolores Cannon has some books that talk about that. Oh, I like and, the Dolores Cannon. Yeah. But, there's, but there's a lot of stuff in some of her work too that seems completely hijacked. No, yeah, well, that's that's typical because you know people don't test what they're doing they don't go about it in a, in a scientific way you know and try it and these aren't 100 percent, but that's a very small percentage that they're ever wrong you know so yeah. and you know how do you figure out what's the source of it whether it's the origination or the reception point yeah, but I think it's important. That's a good point. I, and I think it's important for the audience because, again, nobody reads. We encourage you guys to read the wave. But, and I'm going to be doing a lot on that when these, when these public, you know. Reading the wave changes your brain. Changes your life. Changes all of your lives, probably. But, but, the, but the truth is, is, man, I just rabbit holed and lost my train of thought. I was going to say. But it'll come to me, but. You're having like, a your moment. I am. It's okay. It happens. You want, you want, you want to talk yeah, harder. Laura, this is this is a little bit off tangent, but it's one question that I've had. We were kind of talking about like the human experiment earlier. 
And I thought about religion because obviously we have like our own backgrounds with religion. Is religion in some sense a petri dish to observe human behavior that then is taken from localized sections and then used on mass for mass mind control? So like you could take like, you know, take like a cult. Is that being studied at a hyperdimensional level of like how humans interact and what control mechanisms are orchestrated in place to control those people? And do they, they harvest that or like collect that intel and then bring it back to like a fourth density headquarters and say, okay, this worked well in this localized situation. Now we know these techniques will now be used in math and we can introduce those, introduce those in mass to mind control people and steer the public in one way or the other. Well, I would suggest that fourth density uh, individuals, STNs, whatever, probably already know our psychology better than we know, uh, you know, just about anything else we know. And if anybody is studying or experimenting, then it would probably more uh, be more at the human level, uh, even even though they are often directed and guided by 40 STS, in some cases they're not. They're, they're just, you know, they're wound up and put here and, and set to run and do whatever it is they do. Uh, and then they, you know, make big pronouncements, you know, like the Milgram experiment, you know, how this worked and how that worked. And then they all get on the bandwagon. So, no, I think that um, probably 40 STS knows us really 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 well and they know how to manipulate us and, and i mean they know what kind of dreams to send us and they know what kind of you know problems to bring into our life to hurt us the most and harvest the suffering from that and of course they're harvesting the suffering from cult activity um and they're probably even providing some of the impetus for the formations of the cult activities i mean Danikin wrote a book about that, about you know, appearances of the Virgin Mary and how those were like extraterrestrially inspired or ultra terrestrially inspired to, uh, you know, create loose factories, so to speak. So yeah. it's weird. I, I had, I wouldn't call them visions, but I have like moments now where I, Hunter knows this, where since I, you know, really got connected to your work. Where I see the harvest, like I can see the hierarchical nature of how people react, yeah, and then how they take it out on like the next person that comes into their energy field. I mean, I've seen it. And sometimes I've seen it where it's almost like I've become a ghast. Like I literally have to like pull back and be like, because yeah, I started doing that stuff too. It freaked me out when I was seeing it. I was seeing how people, oh lord. You know, when you start seeing, you can't unsee. That's one of the one of the effects of reading the wave, or or for me, it was one of the effects of interacting with the seas, and from which I then wrote the wave so that other people could have the same experiences that I was getting in the direct interaction. Remember in the book when you talked about or the students at the high school? Oh yeah. Yeah, it was bizarre. I mean, I'm just sitting there, just and I couldn't hear a thing. All I could do was see, and it was—I I felt like an anthropologist observing, you know, a bunch of apes in the jungle or chimpanzees or whatever. And um, and you, you kind of get that way, and, and you get to the point at a certain point where you go in the supermarket and, and you see all these people around, and you see how they're interacting, and you feel so sorry for them because you know they don't—they don't have a freaking clue. No idea. You know, and it's just like, what do you do? You know, you, so it's you, like now. I think the best analogy of that now is walking in public and watching people wear masks. Yeah, and then kids with masks on. Yeah, and, and it's like it's sick. It is sick. Well, okay. I'll say since I've since I've read the wave, I will have this weird sensation when I'm out in public, where I almost like get a glimpse into someone's emotional state. Like I could just look at, it doesn't happen all the time, but I'll like walk by someone. I'll be like, whoa, like, why is that? That's like jealousy or like some weird emotion. 
that is like I pick up on, or if you see like a couple interact and you're like, wow, that couple is like fighting, but you don't see them. You just see them standing there, but there's like a weird energetic contract. So I'll say that definitely happens to me all the time now. And if I like don't focus in on what I'm doing and I'm just out in public, I can kind of see that manifest if I just kind of like relax and like well, see it. It's weird. You have, you have to get to a place, Laura, of compassion because I'm even deeper than Hunter and my wife is the same way now. Like we're so intuitive slash empathic. We sense based on their voice a while. Let me have what you got. My cat is departing the room. <laughs> no, wait a minute. So maybe we need her energy. Um, but yeah, you, you know, how like you can just talk to people and you just, the, they're projecting everything in their tone of voice. Well, you realize what what is happening is as these changes begin in your brain and as bizarre things begin happening in your reality, and as you begin seeing things, you are literally moving into a different reality. Right. And when you look at these other people, you know, they we share the same space, just like we share the same space with cats and dogs. But you are as different from them now as probably, you know, you are, a dog is different to a human being or whatever. You know, what I'm saying is, is that you, they are, they are more like the flora and fauna of the planet and you are in a different reality. Because remember, animals are second density and we share the space with them and we see them and we observe them and so forth and we are third density, okay. Fourth density does the same thing. And as we began to see the same things, the fourth density can see and understand. We begin to become part of the fourth density reality already. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Which I feel like talking about networking i feel that when you're in a room full of like you do that at your chateau all the time but when you're in a room full of very consciously aware you know higher frequency resonance vibration people you can you can project that resonance and it's it's pretty visceral like you know it's noticeable like you were saying when you first had your meetings of people and everyone came together like you could just see the energy in the room from everybody having these like super mind altering, conscious expanding conversations. Whereas it's just the opposite. If you go into like a church or you go into like a giant mall and you see like all these people in dissonance, it's crazy how, how observable it really is. Once you get to a place where you truly can observe it. Yeah. And the nice thing about it is the, the really uh, unique thing about it is, is the way we've gone about doing it is, Kind of, you know, it's very Gurdjieffian, very fourth way, which is working with the reality you have been given. You don't have to go and become a monk right. you know, to, to raise your vibrations. You don't have to become a yogi. You don't have to become a faker. You don't have to do any of those things. You can work with the reality in which you find yourself, you know, the relationships in which you find yourself. You know, in some cases, you have to, you know, sever some relationships or they sever naturally when you begin, you know, to manifest yourself in a different way. But, you know, it's, you're working with real life. You're working within real life and changing your frequency, changing your vibrations, becoming collinear with a group, with groups of people. And it all comes about through communication, discussion, you know, there's endless, you, you see in our forum, endless discussions and sometimes, you know, detailed and back and forth and back and forth. And, you know, we do that here physically with each other. We, we talk, you know, talk, 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 you know, discuss and, you know, analyze and, and bring in everything you can think of to, you know, to, that applies to the situation and all your feelings and your, and your thoughts about something. And so all of those things, and that's what we did with the seas, actually, if you read through the sessions, you know, sometimes we discuss things to, you know, what you would think think was an almost boring, tedious extent, but that was actually necessary in order to, you know, get the brain to work its way around into learning how to get all the wheels and levers and everything that in your brain really to actually work. Because most people's brains don't work. 
They can't ask a sincere question. They can't do anything without anticipation. You know, they don't know how to use their most valuable asset, which is their brain, their, their mind, because I'm not going to limit it just to the physical brain activity, but the mind. And the mind, of course, is totally involved with consciousness and soul. So, so that's what we, what we advocate is working within real life, doing what you do in real life. You don't have to withdraw. You don't have to, you know, I mean, it's good to meditate when you need to, but you don't have to. Yeah. Or one question I wanted to ask you is again, a little off subject as far as your writing goes as someone that, you know, I guess I'd say I'm aspiring writer. Do you have like a practice where you show up and you're like, today I'm just going to write and whatever comes out is going to come out? Or do you just kind of write as you see things happen to you? Or do you have like a like strategic, like, okay, today between these hours is when I'm writing, whatever comes out, comes out? Or is it more like free flowing for whatever your stream of consciousness is going towards? Uh, well, as you know, I don't write fiction. Uh, I have something to say. And the problem for me is, is that what I have to say is sometimes so freaking complicated that figuring out a way to go to start at point A and get to point B is almost agonizing. And I will write, 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 write. And then I go through and I read and then I see this needs to be grabbed and moved here because it's better there. So I'll move a chunk of text and then I'll read through it again and I need to add more stuff. I'll have other people read it. And then if they have questions, they'll annotate those questions. And then I go back through and I write more. And I write, I mean, that was, the process of writing for Paul and Mark was probably one of the most painful things I ever did in my life because that topic was so complicated. And I did the best I could to simplify it and to try to make it as chronological as I could, but but I explained in the beginning, sometimes, you know, I have to follow a thread to an end and then back up and start and follow the next thread, which goes a slightly different direction. But somehow these two threads that I followed each to its end somehow connect together. At the end. And that's, it's, it's like putting a mosaic together. That's kind of how the universe works though. And I, and I want to commend you because I finished the book and thank you for writing it. But um, you wrote a book that was not only difficult to finish and, and, and probably tormented you in a lot of different ways to actually write. I mean, you think about the average Christian. We'll just use them. I can say Abrahamic adherent, but the average Christian, if they read the book and get to the end, there's only bad things that can come to their faith in their mindset because their mindset is, you know, Christianity is everything I hold dear. And by the end of the book, you kind of unravel it is for what it is without commenting because I want this podcast to stay up. But it's it's so awe-inspiring. Like it, it, it's, I struggle now to have any conversation with people that want to like, you know, thump the Bible against their chest in any way because I just kind of feel like they, they're just, they're, they're not learning. But remember, remember, at the end of From Paul to Mark, there is a Christ. Yes. yes. There is Christianity. Yes. I mean, and, you know, for, for me, that was just like the most positive outcome that could possibly yeah. have happened. And it, and it happened in the course of writing it. Right. You know, so... Um, yeah, there there is a very real Christianity, and I would say it's an esoteric Christianity. Yeah, uh, and uh, very few people know or understand it. And if you if you even want to say this, I would say that what the C's share with us is esoteric Christianity. You know, and that's what that's what Paul was all about. He was all about seeing the unseen. So. And knowing that you are a spirit being and that you are here to take dominion over over the world in a certain sense. 
but hopefully well, to, to return to a fourth density state. That's what's funny is because I can, after reading Paul to Mark, you can go back to the Bible. And now that you have an expanded state of awareness, you can read, like you're saying, you know, there's some truth in it. You can read it for what it is. And it makes a lot more sense in the context of a hyper dimensional uh, viewpoint that you can come across and then tie in these historical narratives. And uh, um, I get into like, I, I wouldn't know if I would call them like theological debates with my mom, but it's kind of funny because my mom was more of like in my household who raised me because my dad was like, he would go to church or whatever, but he's just not really interested. Um, she like instilled the stuff that I learned in church at a young age in me. And in a way I told her that that kind of like led me to my understanding now because it made me curious to seek truth because I would read and I would dig into things and I would try to understand things and I would go. So in a funny roundabout way, like Christianity, even if you just took it on the surface, it kind of like, if people will like actually go in and read the text and go back to stuff, it brings you through all these through, through lines to where it's like, you know, you actually see the truth for more of what it is. But I think a lot of people just don't even possess the critical thinking skills to take a text, break it down, understand like, historically of where it's from. So that's what I loved about Paul DeMarc. And I kind of want to ask that about the writing, because to me, it, it would take, it's, it was such a monumentous task to pull all of that information together and then orchestrate it in a way to where like linearly, at least for the purpose of reading a book, it makes sense. I would just recommend everyone to go read it because it kind of, to me, like made sense of like what I was taught bringing brought up, you know, in a religious household. Um, so I don't know if that makes sense, but I just, it was an amazing book and I loved it. So <laughs> it was agony to write. It was agony. I mean, I wrote the way in an almost translated. Yeah. You know, I mean, I, I mean, it, th those that came out of my fingers, like, you know, white hot. Right. Lover, you know, emerging from a volcano because I really had to say these things. And but when I did Paul to Mark, I had all these things to say, but I also knew that I had to work with the material that I was given and I had to deal with that and deal with it in such a way that people could see how everything was getting. I knew the answer after, you know, so many years of research, I figured it out, but how am I going to convey that to somebody else in a way that they will see and understand it? I have to use the material that I'm given and I have to use it, you know, wisely. So that was, that was the agony of that one. It was, man, I, I got to the point where I couldn't even look at it again. I couldn't even look at the text. I mean, it was like, you know, I'm, I'm going to jump out the window if you make me look at that again. <clears throat> it was funny. Jay sent me a picture last night of, I think it's called the Shroud of Turin. What is oh the, my God, it's on the, the Shroud? Magazines. They always like recycle it, like on the magazines at the grocery store, or whatever where they have them. But I was just like, man, all these years, and that people still like they love to just go off down the deep end into thinking that. And it's, uh, I think, like reading the wave, um, it can be so destabilizing to people. They want to like go back to like what's comfortable to them. And sometimes the truth isn't always the most comfortable thing, but it also helps. Like it's more comfortable to know the truth. Wouldn't you want to know the truth about, you know, like something bad going on in your life instead of just being blind, like blissfully ignorant to it. Well, there are people that can handle the truth and, you know, I mean, they may have to reincarnate another 500 times before they get to the point where they can handle the truth. Uh, you know, or frankly, for me, you know, having to reincarnate 500 more times to, you know, it's just, I mean, this, this life has been, you know, rough. I'm out of here. I'm out of here. I don't, here. I don't, I don't want to do this again and again, again, but there's some people who revel in it and there are some people who are weak and there are some people who just aren't in, they aren't capable and, and, you, and you can't push them. Because, I mean, back to the bell curve. Right. 
Uh, there's a there's a couple couple more topics, and and hopefully, we, and then we'll, and we'll wrap this up at least for this initial foray into it. But um, you know, in the, the I want to talk a little bit more about Trump because I think it's relevant. But um, in in, in the in, in the underground or Tibetan articles, Ilian talks about the descending branch and the ascending branch. Right, and I think it's really really a profound way to look at spirituality because I think, you know, and you do a really good job in the articles of arguing that a lot of people, quote unquote, spiritual gurus and teachers think that there's only one branch of spirituality or one way, right? And it's, it's not true. There's obviously the, the left-hand path and the right-hand path and the left-hand path is not going the same direction as the right-hand path. And, and I think it would be interesting for you to kind of define that because I do see a lot of new agers get caught up in that. They get lost in that. That's a that's a that's a vortex. Well, one of the things that they're you know they're all about is you know like I said, we talked about before you know my truth, your truth, etc. Right. And then they talk about you know peace and vibrations, and if you have such and such vibrations, you know you will have total peace, and you you'll and you'll magnetize this and that and the other thing to yourself and and you know well lots of luck because you know there it doesn't really happen that often or for that many people every once in a while somebody pretends it happens or they but you know it's like the ancient philosopher said you know don't ask you know about a man who is completely happy until he's dead because <laughs> you know you, you can't know um but what we find if when we get really into the spiritual realms is that there is there is conflict right there is conflict between the positives and the negatives you know between the ascending path and the descending path between the right hand path and the left hand path and you know if you have to understand that the, that there is going to be conflict because it doesn't do anybody any good for some guru to say, well, the only reason they have conflict in their lives is because it's something going on in them, you know, they've, right. attracted, they've attracted conflict. Well, you know, some, sometimes, you know, conflict comes into a person's life because they're shining the light right. on the darkness and the darkness doesn't like it. And there are people who need to shine light on the darkness because, you know, if you don't, what you don't know about can hurt you. Right. And right. It has been, and it has been keeping people down and depressed and repressed and suppressed for you know millennia. And the condition of the world out there as we see it now is just a complete example of this fact that people are not aware of how much darkness there is and how darkness insinuates itself into your life. And now they've got children wiping off their body parts and they've got you know, adults, you know, wanting to make it legal to have sex with infants and, and you know, endless abortions, you know, for birth control and genocide being committed. And we swim in a sea of lies. And if anybody is, you know, tries to tell me that, oh, this is, uh, you know, people are swimming in the sea of lies because, you know, that's, they're, they're attracting it to themselves. They're bringing it on themselves. Well, you know, well, horse hockey. Um, so yeah, spirituality is a battle. And it's not just a battle against yourself and your own, uh, you know, baser nature, your own reptilian mind, your own reptilian brain. Because we have, you know, we're a smorgasbord of what's out there. And you have to, you have to fight. You have to... You have to struggle, and it's not always a struggle against yourself. Sometimes it's a struggle against a lot of different things. Um, so this is one of the things that, that Ilian makes pretty clear, the existence of the darkness and the necessity for struggling and the necessity for, you know, fighting for what's good and proper. And, you know, we have to, because you know what? If we don't, it, it will not prevail You know, if we give up to it. And that's the problem with a lot of the new age stuff because they're teaching people to be insipid, to be pusillanimous, to give up, to give in, to um, turn the other cheek. Turn, turn the other cheek. Turn the other cheek. Well, 
<clears throat> excuse me, that's uh, that's kind of some of the worst advice that was ever given, you know. Um, yeah, so we have to we have to understand what's going on, and we have to we have to fight. And I would say that you know, read the wave, read the, those articles about darkness over Tibet. Um, you know, there's thousands and thousands of books that need to be read for anybody to be fully cognizant of all the stuff that's going on out there. Now, I know that not everybody can do that. Number one, they, they don't have the time because they're working, you know, they're supporting a family, you know, trying to make a living. Um, they're doing any number of things that, you know, make it impossible for, you know, they're not a fast reader. Uh, they can't afford the books. Our library is not close enough. The books that they need to read are not available in the library. Well, guess what? I did all that reading. I did it for everybody. And I wrote about it. And I put it down. I put it in the way. I put it in all my other writings, you know, constantly. You know, I've read tens of thousands of books. Literally. I'm not joking. I know. And, it, and I'm condensed out of it, distilled from it. You know, the most important elements. You know, and I give it a, and you know, the wave is on my website. I know. I, by the way, I have that PDF for free. I, I've given it to probably hundreds of people. Yeah, it's free. I mean, I appreciate it when people buy physical copies because that yeah, might work for our organization. But I'm not putting a price tag on it. I'm not going to make it so that it's unavailable to anybody who has the ability to read it. Just read it. And and if you can't read 10,000 books, you can read eight. That's right. And you can get the benefit of 10,000 books in those eight. Well, if you read the eight books, you're never going to stop reading the rest of her books, but because they're profound to me, I mean, and we've covered them, I think, pretty good. But I, I do want to ask you, and we'll end it with this, and this may be 15 minutes, who knows, 10 minutes, but who is Donald Trump? Like, what in the hell is he or was he like when he came to power in 2016, was he a force of benevolence? Was he a guy who's just been a Jesuit, you know, in the pop pocket, in the pockets of the Jesuit fourth density as the, you know, the opposite of what Hillary represented. And, and the reason I asked that Laura is because at the end of his term, I mean, he did so many amazing things while he was in office you know, on paper, statistically, all these things that happened. But then at the end, it was like you had what happened in 2000, you know, on, on uh, January 6th with, you know, Hunter and I have a very close personal friend who's in prison, um, you know, Pat Stedman, who, by the way, I sent his books, your books to him while he's in prison and they were all sent back. I told you that. They literally would not allow him to get your books. Oh, really? All of your books were sent back with, Federal pen where he's at in New Jersey. I can get the name of it. But, you know, he corresponds with me through CoreLinks, which is the uh, prison email system. And he wanted to read your book so bad. And he was like, yeah, they said they were, everything comes through. As long as, you know, they check the books, you know, to make sure there's nothing put in the paper bounce, but everything gets through. Your books were denied. I sent him the first three and all of them were denied. But anyway, he was also very big proponent of the V. So was he replaced? Like what happened with Donald Trump? Was he under projection or mind control at the end? I mean, it's, I know it's a complicated question. All right. Well, let me, let me, let me approach it from a couple of di different directions. First of all, you know, you know, a tree by its fruits. And if you look at Donald Trump from the other, okay, he was successful. He made billions. He did real estate. He did some, you know, some possibly borderline questionable business practices. But let me tell you what, if you're in business in the United States and you don't do borderline questionable, you, succeed. you don't yeah, you succeed. Right. Uh, you know, and right. find loopholes and, you know, when you do your taxes, those loopholes exist because, you know, some people are smart enough to hire a, a good accountant to help them use those loopholes. Okay. So... so he had his first wife and he had what uh, three children with her 
He had a second wife, had a child with her, and now he's got a third wife, and he's got a child with her. You know, that's not terribly unusual in our culture, in our society. You know, I mean, I've been married twice. You've been married twice. What? Three times. Three times. <laughs> and you consider yourself to be a decent person. Yeah. You know, shit happens when people yeah. get into relationships. And it doesn't mean, it doesn't mean, matter whether you're a billionaire or not a billionaire. That kind of stuff is going to have relationship problems. And, you know, a healthy man in the United States where, you know, sex is, is free and easy and so forth, you know, they have affairs, they, you know, encounter women and these women and throw themselves at them, especially if they've got a lot of her money. You know, it would take somebody who was absolutely superhuman to have a perfect record in that respect, okay? Just saying that. But look at his family now. His family is close. They're supportive. They're decent. Mm -hmm. They're decent people. He raised decent children. Now, I'm not crazy about the fact that, you know, Jared Kushner and, and, and his Zionist tendencies. And I'm not crazy about the fact that, uh, that, that Trump gives some or has always been very supportive of Israel. He's recently said some things that were, you know, quite critical because he's seeing something. When he got in there, I think he was extremely naive. He trusted the wrong people. He put some wrong people into positions of power that he shouldn't have put in there because he was naive. He knew that there was kind of a swamp. He just didn't know how bad it was. How deep it went, yeah. Uh, yeah, and that's, you know, that's, if you don't understand hyperdimensional realities, you can't understand how deep it is and how bad it is. So, so do you, do you really think he didn't understand that? Because I could, I could. Really think he didn't understand it. I really think he, you know, because he doesn't read. Yeah. He's not a reader. Right. You know, and that's, that's a real shortcoming. Honest to God, it's one of the, it's a big shortcoming. People who do not read. Right. Because, you know, I mean, John Kennedy read two or three whole newspapers every single day of his life you know he need, he knew directly what was going on he had an education you know he was a, a tremendous reader and look at the education that vladimir putin has right and that man can you know he's educated yeah and we don't we don't have the kind of meritocracy in the u.s that rewards people for being educated and we right. should because if Donald Trump had been really, really educated, and if he had been a reader, there he would have done so much more in his first term than he ever did, and he wouldn't have been blindsided by picking the wrong people. And you know, some and in some cases he'd pick somebody and then he'd get rid of them and get, try to get somebody else because you know there were all so many, you know, Washington D.C. insiders, and he thought he had to get somebody who knew how the system worked to help him out. And he's. So he's well, I don't mean to cut you off, but do you just because this is advanced stuff, but do you think that he supported the vaccine because he trusted the, the, the science advisors, the, the Fauci morons and all of them? Yeah, he did. But he also, you notice, was talking about other things. Yeah, Ivermectin, yeah. HCQ. HQ, yeah. You know, so he was hearing things from different people right. and he was, you know, kind of obliged in a certain sense to support or uh, this Fauci fellow, uh, and he, he didn't read enough. He wasn't educated. <clears throat> so he made a lot of mistakes. But you know what? He did his damnedest to fill his promises that he made to be elected. <clears throat> and, you know, he had basically, is a good-intentioned, really kind of average guy, <clears throat> who was in a position and has a certain kind of talent for making money. He's good hearted. He definitely he, is good hearted. I know that because I've listened to people he work loves for him. Children and his children love him. But if, we, if, you, if, if you ever interview or not interview, if you've listened to people who, who've worked for him, they've all black, white, green, yellow have all said to a person that he is one of the most 
amazing employers that he would always go out on his way. I mean, I, 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 I did deep dive research into this and I've seen interviews from the eighties, you know, even the seventies about people that worked for him, like at his hotels and he was always revered. He was revered. There was no one that talked shit about him. All that was a, was a leftist program. The people who now have what they call Trump derangement syndrome, right? You know, who hate Trump, and they'll say, "I absolutely hate Trump." Right, right. right. He's a demon. They yeah. are programmed, right? They are programmed. Now, I will admit that you know, back in the day when Trump was just you know a billionaire going around having affairs with women and getting you know whatever billionaire playboy, but right. billionaire playboy, I just thought, well, you know, he's he's, he's kind of clownish. Right. But to each his own, you know, he's got the money. He's in that position. I mean, if I had the money and I was a guy and I was in that position, what would I do different? So, I mean, it wasn't like very judgmental, but I didn't like have this particular, uh, you know, particular liking for him or whatever. But at this point in time, years have gone by. And the proof of the pudding is his family. Yeah. Family. And that is, to me, it's like super, super important. You look at the Biden family. <laughs> I was going to say, contrast that with the Biden family. <laughs> Disgusting. Well, more, I, don't want to rab- I don't want to rabbit hole too much about the Bidens, but we should talk about this for a second. So it, it's a known fact that Joe Biden, his wife was killed. And then right. the new wife, whatever her name is, Joe Biden showed up in literally three days when he was a U.S. senator. So then you've got these rumble videos, Hunter and I have seen them, where they, you know, whoever this anonymous uh, editor, video editor on rumble was, but they, he stitched together. I mean, it's, it's so convincing. In fact, I would say that you can't disprove it, that the real Joe Biden was actually dis- gotten rid of in 2008, and that whoever is now Joe Biden, obviously there's many, personifications of Joe Biden and truck doubles, clones, whomever, the guy that has dementia that's quote unquote the president right now. But it's pretty fascinating, Hunter, right? That to see the original Joe Biden, what he looked like and how he spoke versus whoever this guy, this doppelganger, this Manchurian, whatever you want to call it, that's in the White House now. But I mean, the whole thing of Joe Biden is insane. I mean, as you know, in the last four years, There's been probably, what, 100,000 people who have captured, like, you know, different videos of different people proclaiming Joe Biden. I don't want to get into the whole QAnon thing, and it's a show, and it's, you know, a a Hollywood movie thing, but it's obvious that Joe Biden is not Joe Biden. Well, I don't know if I'll necessarily agree with that. I will leave it open as a possibility. I'd have to see the evidence, and I can't watch Rumble because I'm in France. I'll send you, yeah, I'll send you, I'll send you when I find it. I'll, I have it somewhere hidden, but it's pretty, yeah, it's pretty difficult. Videos can be, you know, edited. But having said that, you know, I don't, I don't see any major reason that they would want to change him if they've already, if they've got him, unless he died. That's he, what I mean. Oh, that's what I mean. Like he's, you know, he he's died. been replaced. Like I, he's he your head, and you know, obviously they would possibly go along and do that. But the whole thing about that whole family, you know, the filthy, the filthiness, the disgusting. Insane. I mean, they're like trailer trash. They are. Yeah. They're like trailer trash. Yeah. Well, here's my, here's my question, Laura. I think, you know, say what you will about Trump. At the very least, I think he was one of the only people that was able to come from outside to get in that system. Because if I want to be president, you want to be president, Jay want to be president. And there's Russell. no feasible... Yeah, there's no feasible way I would ever get backing. I would ever get anything to like rise up through the ranks or have that because, but because he had money, I don't know exactly how he funded it, but he was at least able to like, he had credibility, he had clout, he had all this like PR going into it to where it's like most people recognize the names. So are like, okay, I can listen to him and whatever. But like if one of us or anybody that actually could read wanted to run for president, there's no feasible way we could like accrue the resources to be able to do so. So at the very least you have that. But the question is from that, are these Joe Bidens, all these people, 
is there a way for anyone else to even like come through the system that has good intentions? That's what I was going to go. Make your way up through the ranks. And then, you know, who's to say they don't pull you out one night in, the, in a van and go make you do something and put it on video. And it's like, well, you're going to vote how we want. And then you're going to do what we say now from here on out. No, how the system runs. And no, I don't think it's possible for anybody else. I mean, maybe, maybe uh, Elon Musk or somebody, but I don't think he wants the job. Um, but I don't, uh, you know, Trump is a rare phenomenon in a lot of ways, and he's well-meaning. He's not, he's not the most brilliant thinker on the planet. So you from- don't think he's going to win then this coming, coming election? He'll win, but they're going to try like hell to steal it. Oh, yeah, there's no way he can't win. I mean, he won last time. Yeah. Are you kidding? Well, that's the question. Is it how value or how is it even worth voting? Does the vote matter anymore? So, so I actually, this is interesting. I talked to somebody yesterday who's involved in American politics who I won't name, but he's pretty high up. He's a past friend. Connor, you know who this is. And he told me that there is no possible way that anyone could beat Trump unless he's not on the ballot. And that was interesting coming from his mouth saying that because it was almost like the expectation is they're going to kill him, which I didn't ask him because we were talking about other things. But we know the election's rigged. We know the system's rigged. We know the voting is rigged. We know all these things. How could it possible? How could he possibly win another election when everybody at this point, not everybody, we know there's enough people that still don't know it, but there's enough of us that do know that it's rigged. How can they even have an election in the U.S.? Well, you know, we're going to see, from what I understand, the Republican Party is going to start using some of the same tactics that the Democrat Party did, whether they'll get away with it, because the Democrats, you know, uh, they're, they're controlling the system completely. Yes. I don't, but the people... If the people were actually being considered, Trump will win the election easily. You know, and, and there's enough people that are going to get out and vote for him, so that if you know if they eliminate all of the fake votes, the, uh, the illegal votes, and so forth, you know, Trump will win. But here's here's the thing: if you're paying attention, you notice that Joe Biden, Hillary Clinton, none of the, they could not attract crowds like Trump. No. I mean, and if you look at the way they attract and the way people come out and the way they support him, the way they line up on the roads, the way they fill stadiums, you know, just think about it. You know, the majority of Americans are behind Trump, the majority. And I would say that it still proves that goodness, wholeness, integrity matters to the majority. Like, even if they're not smart and they can't read. The majority back Trump. So if, you know, what that's going to mean in the election, if they're going to, you know, blatantly steal it, if they're going to try to assassinate him, if they're going to try to put him in jail or whatever. Uh, he, you know, he just said today that he'll be, he'll gladly go to jail and be, a, you know, another Nelson Mandela. But, you know, he's getting up in years. You know, he doesn't have a lot of time to really, you know, do anything. So, and of course... The way people support him right now and the way they see the system being rigged, the continuous and constant attacks against Trump have primed people so that if anything happens to Trump, that may just trigger a revolution. That's what I was going to ask you. That that would be my guess, that, that killing him, he'd be the ultimate martyr. That would be the, that would be the final sacrifice to, to, to turn the USA upside down. Yeah. So it's uh, it's going to be, you know, I personally, and you know, I voted for Trump. I said in my, my overseas vote last last time, and I will do so again. Um, but frankly, I don't have a lot of hope because the system is so rigged, and the you know they've got the fox watching the chickens. <laughs> So, um, I mean, like, 
If I thought, if I said what I really thought, you wouldn't be able to publish this video. <laughs> save it for email or save it for when I hit the end recording. Well, yeah. I mean, I think we can wrap up. Um, I think it's two hours. Everybody, yeah, everybody go out and vote for Trump. Even if you don't think that your vote's going to make a difference, at least you will know you've sent the signal into the system. And your vote will be there if anybody ever finally gets around to a forensic audit. I think I so, think you have a C's call coming up this month, and I think maybe you can ask them for some insights. I mean, I know they've already said that the wave is here and that expect expect excitement and all, a lot of unpredictability and variable dynamic occurrences and events. But uh, maybe we can ask deeper, like. How's that? How's that going to? How's it going to be affected? <laughs> and then their answer will be, "Say, wait and see." Yeah, they love close. Wait and see. Yeah, well, we, we try to get as much as we can get. You know, as often as we. So, awesome. Yeah. All right, we'll, we'll we'll shut this one down. So, um, guys and gals, we appreciate you guys staying with us on this amazing, if I would say extraordinary journey of six, uh, six episodes, uh, two hours each. So I can't wait to run these. These are going to run, uh, starting in the middle of May. Uh, again, I'm Jay Campbell, Hunter Williams. And for Laura Knight, Yadchik, we will say, uh, until the next time, everybody take care. And remember learning is fun and life is lessons. Knowledge protects ignorance and dangers. Take care, everyone.